I, I'm going to tonight just kind of do a high-level overview of kind of the type of stuff we do. So I think that's, uh, for a lot of you, probably your first introduction to our work. What uh, we're probably best known for is our work in heart-brain communication at the Institute of Heart Math. And just a couple of high-level concepts here that might be surprising to, to some folks. Uh, first, we now know that the heart has its own intrinsic nervous system called the intrinsic cardiac nervous system. And that's given rise to a new field in medicine called neurocardiology. And there's quite a few neurocardiology groups around actually the world internationally. And it's, uh, it was really in 1991, I think, the first official publication kind of came out in the academic literature claiming that the heart has its own intrinsic brain, though, the heart brain. Uh, this is not metaphorically. They mean this quite literally. The other um, thing that's actually been known since the late 1800s, might surprise some folks, is that the heart, if we're looking at the nervous system neurally, the heart sends far more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. So we all know that the perceptions uh, at the brain level, you know, we see a dog jumping at us or a near car accident, how the, that affects the heart and the body. Uh, of course, that's all true through the, what are called the efferent pathways in the nervous system. Uh, but the afferents, um, if we look at the parasympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system, 90% of the fibers in the, the two vagal nerves, which are very large nerves, over 3,000 fibers in each one, 90% of those are afferent or ascending pathways. And the majority of those come from the heart. So the signals that the heart sends to the, to the brain uh, profoundly affect brain function, perception. Uh, they actually give rise to a lot, to a great deal, to emotional experience, these kind of things. Um, so that's a lot of what of our uh, work in psychophysiology has been about over the last 20 years. So here's just some photos for uh, those that of you that it might be from Missouri, like I am originally, in the show me state, right? Um, of the intrinsic cardiac nervous system in the human heart. So here we're looking at uh, cardiac ganglia. I got a, oh, it's here in my hand. Um, these little blobs here. And at this level of magnification, the main thing is to see is that they're interconnected. Now ganglia, if you're not familiar with the neural, neurology side of things, is just a term given to a functional group of neurons that are all wired together that process information and do functional things. They're found outside of the brain. That same blob of neurons that was up here in our head could be an inner laminae nuclei or the central core of the amygdala or any, any of the other brain uh, centers we, that we talk about. So now we go in another level of magnification into one of these cardiac ganglia. So each one of the little round things is a neuron, right? Now it's interesting, the same recording techniques used to demonstrate both short and long-term memory, like in hippocampal neurons, for example, have been uh, used in the, these uh, cardiac neurons have both short and long-term memory and have all the basic kind of information processing characteristics of the neurons we find in most of the neurons in the brain. In fact, a lot of these neurons were named after uh, cranial neurons because they're basically the same neuron. Actually look like little brains. Now the next, I don't have that slide. I'm having to cut a lot out of my normal presentation here. So this just shows you the distribution. So all these dots are the location of these cardiac, intrinsic cardiac ganglia, again, that are all distributed. So that's the brain part that we're talking about. Then there's about 40,000 sensory neurons. Again, these have been known about for, for many, many, many years, uh, since the late 1800s. These are sensory neurons. So some of you that have a physiology background might know of baroreceptors. Is that a familiar term to some of you? Baro meaning pressure. So these are the types of neurons that were talked about for years and a lot of hypotheses and so on and so on about heart-brain communication. Uh, what we now know is that only about, out of these 40,000 neurons, only 20% are what are now called mechanosensitive neurons, looking at pressure, rhythm, rate, these kinds of mechanical functions. The other 80% are sensitive to biochemistry or chemoreceptive neurons. So each one's a, a multifunctional neuron, so you have a certain biochemical whether it's a hormone or a neurotransmitter or whatever in the blood flow, these neurons give a very specific output. Put it in a different hormone or neurotransmitter, you get a very different specific output from the same neuron. So it's a far more complex picture than what was previously understood or believed. And there's also a lot of evidence now, as I'll get to in the second part of what I'm going to talk about, that these neurons are not only sensitive to rhythm, rate, mechanical forces, and, chem and chemical type things, but also um, magnetic fields. 
So the heart is by far the largest source of rhythmic activity in the human body. Um, and it's, there's really four primary ways that the heart communicates with the brain and body. Uh, neurologically, I was just talking about through the, the autonomic nervous system. Biochemically, in 1984, I think it was, the heart was reclassified as part of the endocrine system. Uh, the first hormone discovered is now called atrial peptide. It used to be called ANF, ANP, uh, nicknamed the balance hormone. It has wide, pretty wide-ranging uh, receptors throughout the body, brain, body, adrenal glands, and so on. Then it was discovered that the heart secretes the catecholamines. Dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and so on are actually created and produced by the heart. Most recently, um, oxytocin is the most recent one to be discovered. That goes back about four or five years now, I guess. Um, time's going pretty fast. It's hard to keep track of it. But anyway, the heart produces as much oxytocin as the brain, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, we find that the heart is the source of oxytocin. Of course, the, the media loves to call oxytocin the bonding hormone, the love hormone, and so on. And a lot of uh, research going on in oxytocin these days. Fourth uh, pathway is energetically. Again, uh, I'll talk more about that, but the electromagnetic and magnetic fields. So the heart is basically uniquely positioned to act as a global coordinator, if you will, uh, in the, the body's sympathy of all the functions. So it helps bind and synchronize the activity across all the different systems in the body. Because here we have a single organ that's the primary uh, system in the neurological system, right? Sending more information to the brain than the other way around. It's creating hormones, also sensitive to hormones. Um, the biophysical aspect is the pulse, and when we feel the pulse, you're feeling the pressure wave, not the flow of blood. So that pressure wave uh, has a synchronizing effect of all the cells in the body as well. Uh, like if we do EEGs and synchronize to that, you can see very clear effects of the pulse wave, synchronizing neural activity, for example. So it turns out being a very useful measure, and I heard somebody mention this in a, a presentation earlier today, I forget who it was, about heart rate variability. Uh, it used to be thought that a sign of good health was a steady heart rhythm. So physicians not that many years ago were taught that if you want a steady heart rate rhythm, you know, unless you do some exercise, climb the stairs, and your heart rate will kind of slowly change and all that. Completely wrong. What we now know is that a healthy individual, our heart rate changes with every heartbeat. It's going on right now, sitting in this, sitting in this room or as you sleep, this intrinsic beat-to-beat -beat variability turns out to be a fundamental and key reflector of resilience, vitality, or overall kind of health status. So loss of this heart rate variability, this intrinsic variability, is a better predictor of future adverse uh, health comes like death, uh, pretty adverse, than what your blood pressure is, uh, whether you smoke or not, what your exercise level is. Okay, so it's a, a very powerful uh, predictive measure. So. Pretty simple, it's, you measure the beat between, the time between each and every heartbeat. Again, that's completely different than heart rate, right, which is just how many times did it beat in a minute, the average of all that. So then you measure that in milliseconds, and then I'm plotting it here in beats per minute, just because our brains work better in beats per minute than milliseconds, and plot that beat per minute equivalent, okay, and then do that for each beat and connect the dots, and that's what creates the heart rhythm. Make sense? Okay. So again, you want variability. So this is what it looks like. That was just a few seconds. Now here we're looking at a few minutes of it. So when the uh, range of it or the amplitude, okay, how th this intrinsic, this is resting state here, by the way, both of these. And these two graphs are from the same individual. So the amplitude of it, that's uh, age dependent. We have more of it when we're young and it gets less as we age. In fact, if we bring you into the lab or out clinically, measure your HRV, uh, I can tell within about two years how old you are if you're on a healthy trajectory. Right? Of course, if you've got a lot of stress and wear and tear going on, that's going to be lower than it should be um, for, your, for your age. So the two graphs, same person. So we're, we're, of course, we're interested in amplitude, but there's something else quite different here. And this is from the same person. In fact, the amount of variability, the range of it, is identical in these two graphs. And in this particular uh, study, in fact, this was a study published in American Journal of Cardiology, is where this data came from back in the early 90s. The, um, 
we used to have a lot of fun in the lab finding new creative ways to get people frustrated and irritated and things like that, uh, or in positive states. But they kept getting on to us, you know, and we had to come up with new ways to do it. But on the top one, all we did was get them frustrated, kind of irritated and frustrated. And what you see happen is that the, the heart's rhythm, the pattern becomes very chaotic looking, very edgy and jerky looking. Okay? So if you're just looking at changes in how much variability goes on, which a lot of people, as all people had done till that time, you know, versus having a mental loving or caring, compassionate state, for example, you come away with the, the answer of no difference. Because the amount of variability is not what was changing, right? But it's the pattern. Okay? So in that top graph with frustration, what that's reflecting or telling us about the physiology is the, at the activity in the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, is out of sync. It's like driving your car with one foot on the brake and the other foot on the accelerator at the same time. Not a good idea to drive your car that way, right? You're going to use a lot more gas, put more stress and strain on the dr drivetrain, the brakes, and so on, wear them out faster. Same thing is true in us. Okay? So that's uh, why these types of emotions have a depleting effect on our psychophysiology and, and over time lead to lowered variability. Same person just switched. Here we just had them use a, a technique. Um, it's one of the, we call them heart focused techniques that allow you to shift into what we call a coherent state now, uh, many years later, which is this sine wave pattern. It's about a 10 second rhythm. So uh, the frequency of that rhythm is 0 0.1 hertz. I mentioned that because that's going to come back again later in the presentation. But here you have nice high variability, like you'd want to see, but it's that reciprocal action that you talk about in the textbooks and autonomic function. Okay. What it turns out, many studies later, is that this ends up being the, really the optimal, uh, the rhythm, if you will, or the physiology of optimal function. So we now know that if you're in this, just switching between a normal state, not even this chaotic, and this coherent state, that increases your reaction times by about 37 milliseconds. So the brain's the big winner. Right? I'll, I'll show you some of the pathways uh, shortly on that. In fact, here they are. Um, so we, again, we've had the heart sending all this stuff, this afferent or ascending information. It uh, stops off at the brain stem here, uh, but there's a very direct, strong neural pathway directly to the, it's called the thalamus, the very core of our brain. Thalamus has many roles, sensory uh, distribution these, for perception, these kinds of things. But another role of the thalamus is that it's the center that synchronizes the electrical activity of all the neurons in our cortex. And of course, we have to have a, the system has to be in sync, a type of what we call global coherence to really perform optimally. So if we're in this desynchronized state, this rhythm here, that's the rhythm that's directly impinging on the thalamus. Simply said, it inhibits the thalamus's ability to synchronize all the, the, the neurons in our cortex. Easiest way to measure this in laboratory type settings is reaction time tests, coordination tasks, things like this. It's been done in labs all over the world, uh, not just ours. And that, in fact, the term given to this effect in the 1970s um, by the Lacy's, a, a very famous psychophysiology research couple, a man and wife team, was cortical inhibition to describe the effect that the heart was having on the brain. So it's a global effect. So that we can measure it easily with these reaction time tests and so on. But that doesn't mean that that's the part of the brain that's the most profoundly affected or the most important. So we've got all this frontal cortical stuff up here, right? which gives rise to things like foresight, right? the ability to understand what our actions in the now are going to do in the future. It's what our animal friends don't have. right? They have hindsight memory, but not necessarily foresight. So goal setting, planning, discrimination of appropriate behavior, abstract thinking, all of these functions are from the frontal part of the brain. For those functions to perform optimally, they need a pretty well refined degree of synchronization. So when we're in this desynchronized state, they're the ones that are kind of taken offline first. You know, makes sense? Probably no one in here has ever had the experience, uh, I'll, I'll admit I did once, where you're talking with maybe your spouse or a colleague or something, and they say or do something that gets you a little upset. And then you say or do something that a minute later you're going, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that or said that. Nobody's ever done that, right? No. I bet a lot of you know people, yeah, who've done that. Yes, right. 
So this, what I just described is really simplifies the physiology of that effect. When we get upset, or we get into a desynchronized state, cortical inhibition, and then we say or do the dumb thing. Right? That usually costs a lot more stress and a lot more time waste and, and so on. So the point of, of what, uh, actually I have a lot less slides in here than I thought, is to be able to shift into that coherent state before we, we do the thing that we later regret. Okay? So that's what a lot of the heart math tools and techniques are about, is to allow us to self-regulate, to get more coherent, to bring in what we call heart intelligence. Um, so what I don't have time to show you tonight is uh, following up on some of Dean's studies uh, with precognition, as he called it. Uh, we also looked at EEG, heart, heart-brain dynamics, uh, in the study where we showed photographs you know, uh, and found that, in, at least in our study, it was the heart that shifted first sent literally a different neurological message to the brain, and then you saw a brain response all of this many seconds before the, the photo. So I think it's some pretty good evidence that the philosophers and the great religions have been right all along. You know, the talk about the heart being the primary center or access to wisdom, to, to intuition, these types of things. Okay, so kind of switching gears now into a, the other half of what I was asked to talk about in my invitation letter. Um, we've done a fair amount of work really looking at interconnectivity. That's really where our, our passions are these days. Uh, I mean, I'm actually funded now. I'm doing, I've got three different military contracts that we're doing pre-deployment studies and this kinds of things, measuring hormones and all kinds of neat stuff, but that pays the bills. But really, our passions are about interconnectivity uh, is where, what we're really about. So we've done some uh, stuff over the years that look at the, how the heart radiates uh, magnetic signals. Now, of course, when we measure the electrocardiogram, you're putting electrodes on the body, uh, and you're measuring the electrical component, whether that's EEG or, or whatever. But of course, whenever there's a flow of ions or electrical current, you create a magnetic field. And human tissue is pretty transparent to magnetic fields. And the, the magnetic field of the heart radiates out into space. With a squid-based magnetometer, uh, you can measure the cardiac field just under three feet from the body. We can do electrostatic measurements in our own lab almost that far uh, with things that are much less expensive than squid-based magnetometers. This is the shape of the magnetic field. It is a toroidal shape. Of course, it doesn't really stop at the knees, or, no, nor is this the right orientation exactly. Very complex kind of spiraling field. But step two of what we then did was say, okay, well, if we look at these fields, is there uh, information encoded in these fields that is related back to the heart rhythm and our emotions. And sure enough, we found that there was. And I have to give also credit. I see Gary's here tonight. We were kind of doing the same stuff at the same time without each other knowing it. Uh, it uh, it's kind of neat to have it uh, kind of figured out uh, simultaneously. I'm not sure who actually did it first, but it uh, doesn't really matter. Anyway, uh, if you look, there is a mathematical relationship between the heart's rhythm, the HRV patterns I was showing you earlier, and these information patterns, as I call them, in the, in the magnetic field okay, that's rated by the heart. Uh, and it's, everything goes on in between, but you can kind of see that in, when you're in that frustrated or incoherent state, you've got a pretty flat, chaotic spectrum. And in the coherent state, you get a nice series of standing waves. And, and actually, if you look at different specific emotions, you can actually start seeing different frequency structures that are rather emotion-specific. So we've done a, a bunch of things. I'm just going to, just due to time, show you a couple. A lot of you have seen the experiments that we did with my son and his dog. It's kind of gotten famous. I'm not going to show that one tonight. Uh, but here's Ellen and Tonopah. So this is looking at the connectivity between humans and horses. So this is uh, the heart rate variability, the heart rhythm of Ellen that we're seeing up here. And here's Tonopah, the horse. And this is an energetic experiment. There is no physical contact, anything like that. It's in a corral. So Tonopah is over, tied up over here, and Ellen goes in, sets down, and does what we call a heart lock-in. And that's where you basically focus in the heart. What we call it heart-focused breathing. It helps shift into coherence. And then you have to activate a positive feeling, appreciation, care, compassion, and then consciously send that, radiate that into the environment or focus it to a place, person, whatever. In this case, it was to the horse. And we see a pretty dramatic state shift in the horse here. And I should say, we did a lot of work leading up to this to know what horses' HRV looked like. We did 24-hour HRVs on a bunch of horses for a bunch of days and so on. Uh, this is an experiment that worked too good. 
in a way. We did, the first time we did it, we did four horse humans. Three out of the four had almost identical shifts, just like that. And the one that didn't, we found out, we were kind of blind doing the analysis, found out later that the one, the horse that didn't have this shift was a horse that was well known for not wanting anything to do with humans. It was very standoffish and that kind of, kind of horse. So, um, of course, horses are well known for uh, having, uh, being tuned into humans in our emotional states, as are dogs. And we've done the same thing with dogs and rabbits, actually, as well. And uh, animals are really tuned in uh, to our emotional state. So here's a, using another type of technique called signal averaging with mothers and infants in this case. Again, it's an energetic experiment, no physical contact. So here we're looking at mom's brain waves and the infant baby's heartbeats. Now this doesn't look, for those of you that know EEG, that doesn't look normal. It's because it's signal average. So we're using the R wave of the baby to signal average the mom's brain waves too. I know Gary, you've done some of this stuff as well. And mom's brain waves synchronize right up to the baby. What we didn't expect probably should have with hindsight, was that mom's attention modulates this effect. It's when mom was paying attention to the baby that her brain waves would sink. We would distract her, get her thinking about something else, it would go away, which is kind of an important finding. It's not just a raw physics coupling kind of thing going on here. All right, so now I'm going to shift into the second part that I was asked to talk about. This is the Global Coherence Initiative. So this is kind of taking a little bit of what I was talking about earlier from the living room, like where we know if uh, sometimes we can walk into a friend's house before we catch body language cues, this kind of thing, or voice tones that we just feel or sense something's off. And sure enough, find out they got a bad you know, call, got some bad news, and, or some people it just feels really good to be around. Well, I think what I'm talking about in terms of the heart's feel and the information patterns can explain that, at least at a local conventional physics level. So let's, why not take that globally, that kind of an idea. So, again, I'm doing about half of what I would like to have done here on both of these topics, but the, there's a lot of research showing that humans are affected by changes in the Earth's energetic fields. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, by energetic fields. Uh, actually, a surprising amount of literature. So we know that if, if the rhythm, there's actually rhythms in the Earth's fields and, of course, disturbances that are well correlated now with changes in our brain and nervous system activity, performance of tasks, a number of different types of tasks, blood pressure, heart rate, hormones. In fact, depending on where we are on the planet and which rhythms kind of dominant, our heart rate literally synchronizes to the planetary rhythms or our blood pressure rhythms. One can be synced to one and another to another. It's just an amazing sympathy of what, what goes on. Traffic accidents, violations, tickets and things. Uh, sync quite well. Number of hospital missions for uh, actually a pretty wide range of diseases. Uh, you could actually add cancer to that list. Societal conflicts, criminal activity, these kinds of things. Really interesting, uh, one of the strongest reflections of changes in geomagnetic activity is changes in, in humans anyway, is in our heart rate variability, in the rhythms of the heart. And a lot of this work comes from a guy that you probably won't know the name, Franz Hallberg. Anybody know that name in here? A couple of you, yeah. Probably know uh, the term circadian rhythm, though. Franz coined the term circadian rhythm in 1948. Uh, Franz is still with us. He's 92. Goes to work seven days a week. University of Minnesota has a floor at the old Mayo building, uh, Kahlberg Coronal Biology Center. Uh, Franz is a wonderful guy. We're, we've been publishing a few papers together. He's on our, our board and very excited about and very involved in our, in our project here. Uh, but he's done a lot of the, the work, especially on blood pressure and hormones and so on. Oops, I'm going to back up here. I'm sorry. You didn't see that yet. So a lot of uh, ancient cultures believe that solar effects, and I know this has probably been talked about at the conference here before, affected humanity in a mass way. The first person to really look at that scientifically uh, was a Russian astrophysicist, Alexander Chesovsky. And the data I'm going to show you in this next slide is his data that was published in 1926 and then immediately written off by the scientific community at that time then rediscovered, and then he was offered a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, true story. So what he did he, during World War I, he observed that it seemed like there were just crazier, bloodier battles, just a lot of nonsense that went on uh, during periods of high solar activity. And that's what got him curious about all this. Uh, I've actually been reading a lot of his stuff, translations of his original work, and it's amazing 
what he was able to do before we had internets and stuff. He did an exhaustive study of human history, looking at major societal geopolitical events and things like this. Start of a war, revolution, major scientific discovery that had global implications, these kinds of things. So the, this graph, starting back at 1749, the blue line, is each year just plotting the number of major global events that had a global implication. So then we plot that up here all the way down here to 1926. Right, so that's the number of global major events. The red line on the bottom is the solar cycle. Think there might be some correlation there. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, I mouth fell open the first time I saw this. This has been verified by a number of different researchers and extended many times. Uh, it's been that's very probably one of the most studied things since then in this kind of space. Now, more, uh, I'm not plotting a lot of the events here, but more locally or in more recent times, uh, here's solar cycle 22, when Iraq, right in the center of it, Iraq invades Kuwait, and we know the play out of that, right? And then uh, almost exactly one solar cycle later, th at the peak of solar cycle 23, 9-11 occurred. So that's kind of what we mean by these major human events. Now, the sun, here we are, uh, we're right here now. The sun took two years off. It was a solar quiet period that somebody forgot to tell the sun what it was supposed to do. First time that's happened in several hundred years that a two-year quiet like this between cycles occurred. That was kind of a, uh, and a lot of people are now predicting from NASA and so on that solar cycle 24, which we're just going into, is going to be a, a doozy, so to speak. Um, so and right here, as we see the, uh, I'm not showing you the slide, I don't think, because of the time. But as these peaks are starting to kick up, it's exactly in time with the Libyan, Egyptian, Japanese earthquakes are all boom, boom, right with these, these peaks that are occurring now. So we're just getting started, guys, so, on the next solar cycle. Now, the media, and unfortunately the scientific community as well, loves to focus on, good Lord, five minutes, okay, I've got to speed up here, on the negative events. And that's true. Eighty percent of the onset of wars in recorded history have started in a very narrow part of the solar cycle. What's also just as true is the greatest periods of human flourishing also synchronize with that same period of the solar cycle. The, the greatest scientific discoveries, flourishing of the arts and the sciences all ride the same cycle. So basically what I'm saying here, this is an energetic influx. Right? And what Shostakovsky called it was an index of mass human excitability, in fact. So one thing humans don't do well with is change, especially if it's energetic change, we don't understand it. So depending upon how well we're able to self-regulate, right, we either take that energy and get all frustrated and start creating you know, conflicts with our family and friends and so on. Right? Uh, that's why you see the increase in traffic accidents and hospital admissions and so on. Or we take that energy and use it in constructive ways to create more cooperative relationships. These kinds of things, right? S solve the problems that we have. So basically, our main message at, uh, from the Global Coherence Initiative is that you know, let's wake up. It's time to take responsibility for our energy, to use these creative in in influxes to manage our day-to-day -day challenges. Because the, the way that this stuff hits us, these, these energetic influxes, is in our emotional body. I mean, that's how it plays out. It's in frustration. It's in irritation. These kinds of things, anxiety. And it really gets down to the management of those on a day-to-day -day level. And that's the greatest thing we can do, from my perspective, to, to really shift the, the same old cycle. So part of the project, there's really two halves <coughs> of global coherence. One is education, public education. There's a membership, there's I think around 35,000 members now that are, are consciously sending care out to places in need on the planet, you know, our prayers and meditations. <coughs> the other part is the science side. And this is the, the goal. <clears throat> excuse me, to have a global network of monitoring stations. Right now we have three, uh, one in California, one in Saudi Arabia, one, one in the UK, and one's going to New Zealand and upstate New York later in the year. This is the picture of the one in California. This is a, it's an underground magnetometer. I don't have, again, time. I've only got four minutes left here. To, so the energetic fields that I'm talking about, one is the geomagnetic field, 
course, the geomagnetic field is critical for life on Earth. It's the main shield from the solar wind. And the solar wind pressure, which travels, solar wind is about a million miles per hour, has enough force that it pushes the magnetic field in on the daytime side of the planet and stretches it out on the nighttime side. Okay. But if you think of the geomagnetic field, the, the static field, as it's called, right, the geomagnetic field, it is stationary. It's like a bar magnet. But if you think of those flux lines as guitar strings, right, even though the magnitude may not be changing, the field lines get plucked as they interact with the solar wind. And they vibrate. And they depend upon these dynamics, they have different resonant frequencies. And our sensors are designed to measure those. That's one of the things we look at. And as it turns out, these are called field line resonances. One of the primary frequencies is 0.1 hertz. You remember that from earlier? That is the same frequency as the coherent heart rhythm. All of these frequencies, of these field line resonances, overlap the human cardiovascular system. Okay, the other set of energetic frequencies are what are called the Schumann resonances. Okay, and that's a resonant cavity between the surface of the Earth and the bottom of the ionosphere. Sorry, I don't have time to explain all this more, but um, there's eight primary resonance frequencies. First one's 7.8 hertz. So a lot of you should be going, aha, that haven't heard this before. That's the alpha rhythm of the human brainwave. So all of them overlap human brainwave frequencies. Okay, so here's a graph. On this graph, one of these is an EEG, and the other is right out of our magnetometers. Which one is the magnetometer and which one's the brainwave? Okay, let's do a vote. How many of you top, on the top think it's the EEG? Raise your hand. Not very many. How many of you think the, the top one's the Earth's magnetic field? A lot of you are not voting. <laughs> okay, it's pretty hard to tell, isn't it? All right, well, here's the answer. Kind of the point, I can't tell. And I know a lot about EEGs and this stuff. So as the fields get disturbed, these, these are globally propagating waves. They're there 24-7. So one of the primary theories is that these resonant frequencies are pulling, interacting with the, our brain and heart and cardiovascular system. So this is a spectrogram. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to go really fast here. Uh, so these are, that's the 7.8 hertz. These are your Schumann resonances. And these are those structural field line resonances down here. So if, if you become a member of the Global Coherence Initiative, you can actually go see the live data from the different sites on the website, that and a lot of other data. So our part two, uh, as we're aud audacious enough, I guess, to suggest that not only are we affected by these Earth's fields, but we can affect those. If human, humanity does, especially emotionality, does affect the, the global energetic fields. So I think it's a great, Roger can talk more about that in his presentation. Uh, we're suggesting, kind of simply said here, that uh, an intention goes out from a coherent heart, and coherent being key, because that's what creates those standing waves. That goes out like a radio wave, and resonates with, modulates, imparts information, if you will, on the Earth's uh, magnetic fields to create more coherence in the, the global field environment. So, and that can be amplified if we do it in groups, uh, especially if we like each other, have a shared intention. I know that's been discussed here earlier. Um, one, uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm a little bit over time, but I'll just give another minute. It's okay. We have a thing at the end. So, a global care room is another aspect of the, the site. If you become a member and you log in and you want to participate in the energetic radiations to places in need, a little dot shows up on the, the globe that is you. So you get to see all the other people that are there doing the same thing with you at the same time to help create that amplification effect. It's a really fun, little fun uh, event. So basically what I'm suggesting is that what we do at the individual level does count. A lot of people think, what can I do? I'm just one person. But really it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how smart you are or anything like that. What we feed the field emotionally, it, we're all the same. So I, well, a thing I like to ask myself at the end of the day or end of the week is what I feed the field today. How much of my time was really being compassionate to my coworkers and caring and uh, really experiencing that versus being tied, wrapped up in my to-do list, right, and irritated because I didn't get enough done and so on. But as we become more individually coherent, self-regulated, we are literally creating a more coherent field that helps others in our personal space. As we move towards creating more coherent classrooms, workplaces, communities, it's a lot of what the Global Coherence Initiative is about, then we move to social coherence. You know, enough communities around the planet becoming socially coherent, 
that's what it's going to take to move us to, uh, to global coherence. A lot more I'd like to say, but I'm over time. So thank you. I appreciate your attention. And okay, let's thank I invite you to become a member. So it's free. Go to glcoherence.org, become a member. We have a minute for two short questions. Douglas? Yes, I have a short one. I, about the Earth's magnetic field and so forth, or the, the, what you were showing at how the cycle. It seems like, have you anything to say about the Great Recession where that occurred during this low period? And it seems like that was a great dislocation. Yeah, there's a, actually a whole several groups of people that just look at correlations between the geomagnetics and solar geomagnetic fields and economic cycles. Um, it, it's strongly correlated. Yeah. Uh, what do you think happens to the heart? Uh, when a person undergoes a very popular procedure for f atrial fibrillation uh, uh, and okay. they burn the AV yeah. node. Ablations. Yes, the coronary ablation. Yeah. Uh, what does that do to the ability to uh, receive the magnetic fields? Um, well, probably not much, but communicating that information back into the system it may, because it, that's not the centering neurons are ablating. By the way, the current work in, in uh, neurocardiology is pretty clear now that the heart's conduction system is actually under the control of the heart's uh, nervous system. So ablations may be a thing of the past, uh, if not too far in the future. In other words, we're treating the wrong thing for a lot of arrhythmias. That's a whole other topic we can maybe have an offline discussion on. Yeah. I was wondering if you are aware of the work of uh, Omram Michael Ivanov who had this theory that the sun is an intelligent star. And as, I, as much as I believe in intelligence at all levels, that, that just, you know, impressed me. Mm -hmm. And he has unbelievable arguments. So his uh, work is translated in English. So just I, have I'm a not, look. but I would like to be. I, yes. I, I have no problem with that idea. Okay, I'll send uh, you I like, the, I'd like to learn more about the it. The name. Yeah, I'm actually just starting to get into a lot of more uh, in the last month, I've had more Russians contact me than in the last two years. And I'm really glad because their literature is hard to get. We uh, can't he get wasn't a Russian. He was a Bulgarian. Oh, Bulga okay. And he, he lived in France. Great. Oh, I, I definitely want to okay. connect with you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think this is a great reason for us to um, get our website translated into different languages because one thing that came up at the member meeting was that um, if we translate in Russia, we can reach out to 16 countries in Russia with a lot of work like this and hopefully start translating to other languages as well. So let's give our um, speaker a great round of applause.